Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. Great. Um, so my name is Hillary Parker. Uh, I'm a data analyst at FD, um, and I'm going to talk about reproducibility and how I've seen it benefit me um, in my job at Etsy. Um, and so first of all, how many people know Etsy? Um, okay, awesome. That's like most everyone. Uh, so for those of you who don't, Etsy is a marketplace for handmade and vintage items as well as craft supplies. Um, and the idea is that you're shopping directly from makers all around the world. Um, so Etsy is a really great place if you have a very specific set of interests. So for example, if you're someone who really likes statistics and statisticians, you can go there and buy like statistical posters with uh, famous statisticians on it. Um, and the really fun thing about this is that you can get to know the maker. So this woman who makes these coasters, she makes a lot of different like fun statistics things. And I think there's someone in the audience wearing one of her shirts right now. Yeah, so. Kai's, there's a Kai Square Tops shirt. Uh, so, anyway, so it's a really fun place to go shop. Um, kind of like one more example of how it's like a fun place to go is it's the type of site where if you go and you search turtle costume, you might find this like, you know, cute costume for a newborn baby, uh, making it look like a turtle. Or you might find an actual costume for a turtle, <laughs> making it look like a hamburger apparently, which is like obviously really morbid, <laughs> morbidly placed on a, on a, on a plate. Um, and so I think there's also a really big opportunity on Etsy right now because last night I went and searched for our stats and there were no results. So if anyone in here wants to make some like handmade items, uh, our stats items, you can really like corner the market here. So opportunity. Um, so anyway, so I wanted to talk about um, reproducibility and how, so first of all, I'm a data analyst at Etsy, so I spend a lot of time making reports, um, talking, making graphs, for example, about how awesome increases with cats. Um, and so I spend a lot of time generating these reports and I put a lot of effort into making them reproducible. Um, and so that word reproducible has in some ways been kind of like cornered by the scientific research community. So um, for example, I was looking on the Coursera class for reproducibility, and there was sort of this paragraph that's like, reproducible research is the idea that data analysis and scientific claims are published with their data and software code so that others may verify the findings and build upon them. Um, and I think that's great, and that's probably the primary goal of reproducibility is like actually reproducing results. Um, but I think it doesn't emphasize the benefits to someone in a, a more a, a non-scientific role such as data analyst or data scientist where the number one goal can actually be saving time. And so saving time, I'm going to go through a few examples from my job of where using reproducible methods has really saved me a bunch of time and a bunch of effort. Um, and sort of with the pitch that if you're in a role, even a non-research, non-publication focused role, focusing on reproducibility can still be really beneficial to you. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is changes to data sources. Um, and so this is sort of, I think, um, a lot of people here probably intuitively understand why this would happen. Um, but I want to kind of borrow upon the um, dplyr Magruder framework here and think about what getting to some sort of write-up or deliverable looks like. So usually you have your raw data, and then you create tidy data from it, and then you do an analysis on that data, and then you finally create a write-up. And so what I was saying before is that reproducibility often kind of looks at this phase, and it says, like, the language of reproduce, reproducibility focuses on whether or not your analysis itself is reproducible, and like the moments when you might have errors in the analysis. So you might be working on an on a analysis and you accidentally reshuffle all the samples and then you, do, you have like an error in your conclusions. Um, and I bring that up because that actually happened to me in grad school where I accidentally reshuffled all the samples and had these crazy results and didn't understand it. And it was because I'd done a step in the analysis that wasn't reproducible. But in the web setting, I think a lot more often what's happening is that your raw data that you're working with is changing. 
Um, and so on and any sort of tech website where you're pulling data, you know, the data is coming in at this like very high volume, high speed. Um, there might be issues with the data. There might be issues with how the data was logged. And so if you don't have this entire pipeline reproducible, then you might have a write-up, and then the data sources change, and you have to completely recreate it. So I see some people nodding. That's probably happened to a lot of people here, where you've written something up, and then you've been like, ah, oh, the data source changed. Um, so in my workflow at Etsy, what this looks like is that I have like the web website, Etsy.com. Then it goes into a data warehouse. Then I pipe it into our studio. I then put it all into my personal GitHub repo. Um, we have like a, a Etsy uh, Enterprise GitHub account. Then I create a readme.r markdown, which then renders into a readme.markdown. And the tools I use for that, from the data warehouse, I use one of like many R packages for connecting to databases. So I use RJDBC. Um, I use Project Template, which is a really cool package for sort of organizing um, project architecture and making sure that it's uniform. And then, of course, I use Knitter to go from the readme.r markdown to the readme. Um, and so just to like reemphasize one more time, again, like the old language of reproducibility is sort of focused on this step, but really I think that the bigger issue is like here or going from here to here. So again, I think you know, this is just sort of an idea of, of what a complete reproducible pipeline looks like. And I've seen this as a success in my job because sometimes I'll have a deliverable, I'm talking within a room to people, and we know that the data was incomplete. We know that there was um, like issues with the, the date ranges that we'd used, or we know that there was like backfilling going on. And so I have before been in a meeting with a bunch of people where we know that the data source changes. I say, oh, hold on, let me run these three R commands and re this repo and re-push it to GitHub, and I have a brand new write-up. It looks exactly the same, but with updated numbers, and everyone's very impressed, and it's a very fun moment. Um, and so I highly recommend doing that, if nothing else, than to impress your colleagues. Um, but then it also obviously saved me a ton of time because I could you know, have the updated report in that moment. Um, so that's sort of, as I said, kind of like the, the obvious example. The next one I want to talk about is how reproducibility can save you time because it can get other people to do work for you. Um, so this one I think is easiest to explain with anecdote, um, which is that um, at one point at Etsy, I was working with our operations team. So the operations team is the group of people who are buying servers, uh, making sure the servers are running configured correctly, making sure that we have capacity for the traffic that we're seeing on the website. Um, and so a big part of that is uh, capacity planning, so doing projections and forecasting on how many servers we should own um, and making sure that we have enough to accommodate like the holiday season, which is obviously like a very uh, busy time on Etsy.com. Um, and so I had this really fun project. I was working with this um, brilliant ops engineer, and he was really excited. He knew very little about statistics, um, but wanted to learn a lot more. And so I worked with him, and I created this big write-up. As I said, I sort of have this like uniform project architecture, have um, all the R code in a GitHub repo, and I'd written up this big um, readme with like all of the kind of different methods that I'd taken. Um, and I, I, I was working in conjunction with him and wrote this up. Um, and it was fun because he was really excited about it and wanted to learn R. He was, he was working in London and I was working um, in the US, so I couldn't like, sit down and show him exactly what to do. Um, but I did create this repo and send him the link and I was like, hey, if you want, uh, you know, feel free to, to play around with this. So this is, again, someone who had never coded in R before. Um, and so at the end of every repo, I have just like instructions, this sort of mostly instructions to myself about how to redo the entire analysis. So like, here's the packages you're gonna need, um, here's all the, you know, like the various steps you're going to take, like source all the different R scripts, and then it'll recreate these plots, and then like knit the final readme, and you'll create this re new readme. Um, so again, I put this at the end of every analysis, mostly for myself, kind of with this like wild fantasy that maybe one day someone else might, you know, want to want to follow it. And this ended up happening. Uh, I went to bed. As I said, this colleague of mine was in London, um, and when I woke up the next morning, he had cloned the repo, uh, changed the data source, 
re taken all my functions, recreated the, all the analysis I'd done for a different data source, and like I woke up to a pull request. Um, and that was great, because that meant that I didn't have to do this entire half of the uh, analysis. Someone else got to do it for me. Um, and so that was like a really rewarding moment, and I think that um, the fact that I had cared about reproducibility really enabled someone else who didn't have any R exposure to, to learn about like creating reports. Um, and so another thing I think that's important here is that if you're working with software engineers, they understand the language of, of, of software sharing and of collaboration. And so as much as you can work in that framework, you'll enable people to learn these tools. Um, so the third thing I want to talk about is a fun project I've been working on recently, um, which is saving time through template responses. Um, so how many people here uh, feel like they spend a lot of time kind of like defining confidence intervals or like explaining statistics to their colleagues? So like show of hands. Yeah, a fair number. More people know Etsy apparently. That's cool. Um, so uh, okay, so. As a statistician, you sort of go through this training where you end up memorizing these templates for like, here's the formal definition of a p-value, or here's the formal definition of a, of a confidence interval. Um, and there's really no reason why R can't do that work for you. Um, and so I worked on a package recently um, at a small unconference in San Francisco with a member of the audience, David Robinson, um, like thinking about this problem and trying to solve this problem. Um, and so what came out of that is this library called explainer with a function called explain. I think it'll be easiest first to go through an example and then after that uh, kind of like talk about the, the, the broader thought there. Um, so with explainer, the idea is that, so let's say you're running like a one sample proportion test. This is um, you know, obviously like a, a basic statistical test you might do in R. Um, the R output is like somewhat indecipherable to a non-expert, or like at least a non, someone who isn't trained in statistics. Um, you have all this like, you know, alternative hypo hypothesis, 95 confidence interval without defining it or anything. Um, and so the idea with the explainer package is that you can take that same two sample proportion test and then pipe it to an explanation and the explanation spits out a human readable paragraph. And that has like <laughs> everything you might want from it. <laughs> Hi. <Nice. laughs> Everyone's like excited now about saving time, right? <laughs> Not ever having to explain a confidence interval again. So the idea here is that this is like, you know, a readable paragraph. It has all the different estimates. This is still very um, proof of concept right now, but the idea is that um, this is something that you can see immediately the value just from, um, from, from within R, but what I'm almost most excited about is that kind of using that workflow I was talking about before, you could do this, this is obviously just a really short uh, uh, R markdown file. You can do that same thing, pipe it to explanation, and all of a sudden you have like this beautiful report that already looks like the deliverable you wanted. So within like two seconds, you can have like this entire report written and save yourself time. So again, it all comes back to saving time. Um, and so, so just sort of to talk a little bit more about the theory here, um, we thought about uh, how to approach this package. So we have um, templates for common analyses. Those templates are then grouped into themes. Um, and so the themes might be um, verbose, where it like, explains all the assumptions, or um, succinct, that might be like a very quick explanation. Um, and then you can also supplement by like building packages on top of Explainer. So we wanted it to be as flexible as possible, where you could have, um, you can like build packages on top of it. You could build it for a very specific method you're working on. Um, and so again, I think this kind of last point will be easiest explained with some um, examples. So um, some people in here might know that I'm like really active with a hashtag called um, our cat ladies. So. Like, <laughs> yay! <laughs> so that's uh, me and another member of the audience, Sandy Griffith, who uh, are really into both R and cats and thought that was cool. So, um, so of course, the first package we built was um, Catsplainer. Um, and then for the name of this function would be Catsplain. And so the idea here is that you would uh, pipe your prop test to Catsplain, and a friendly ASCII art cat will tell you this paragraph. Um, so that obviously will save you some time if you really need cats to explain things to you. 
Um, additionally, uh, we thought, so David had the brilliant idea of complainer, so that one would have complain, and the idea here is that you can save yourself time in various R help forums by just automatically appending a common complaint from R, such as, you should have just read the help page. It's just a question mark, what were you thinking? So again, we're so predictable, we can just save our, our reproducible complaints. Um, and so then uh, we were at this conference, and we're lucky to have Hadley Wickham there, and he actually had the idea of a uh, mansplainer. Um, so that one could be the function mansplain. Uh, and so that one, you know, just creates like a really condescending paragraph, like, oh, you're so lucky that you finally did a hypothesis test for the first time. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, so again, all just proof of concept. Uh, the idea here isn't that, um, <laughs> You know, these are obviously like fun examples, but it's, it's a true testament to a fun conference when you spend most of your time uh, building jokes on top of the package that you built. Um, but we, the idea is really powerful though, and I think that um, it, the idea of being flexible and being able to make kind of the routine parts of statistical explanation reproducible um, will end up, A, saving us a bunch of time collectively, and then B, you can imagine my friend, the ops engineer, who was like so eager to learn statistics, with a function like explain, he'll be able to even further understand exactly what's going on um, when any time he kind of approaches R and starts to try to code with it. Um, I think a lot of people view learning R and learning statistics as the same thing, especially from the software engineering world. And so any, anything we can do to help that happen, I think is, is really powerful. Um, so that's, that's it for my talk. Explainers um, on my GitHub repo. And then I'm a Hilary Detsy and Hipster on Twitter. So <laughs> thank you so much. Wait, wait. So Hillary made a mistake that her amazing talk was just three minutes shy. So now you gotta ask her questions. Yeah. <laughs> so anyone have a question for Hillary? Reproducible complaints. <laughs> do you have your own cat? I do. Can we play of him? <laughs> it's a girl. Uh, can we play of her? <laughs> <laughs> she does have a Facebook page. <laughs> oh my goodness, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. You can virtually play with her. All right, that, that's something. Uh, here we go, right here. Do yeah. I have the hand mic or just shout really loudly? Short question. How hard has it been to get more of Etsy to use your like ideal model here? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> Um, I mean, everyone has their own uh, own preferences. There's definitely it's definitely true that um, like IPython notebooks are very appealing to a lot of people, um, which is like you know great. Anything reproducible. Um, I do think that as people have seen examples of this working really well, it's helped. Um, it kind of depends on what, like, within my, like, set of colleagues, uh, it's definitely been, in fact, just yesterday, just, yeah, yesterday, two days ago, I was helping um, people set up, like, everything that they needed to get this going. Um, but then, you know, kind of, like, on the more, like, traditional business intelligence side, I think that that can be, like, it's pretty hard to pry people away from the, the Excel sheets. Sounds like you've had experience with that, too. Um, so, yeah, so I'd say, like, moderate success. I think. The only way to win this battle is through showing people that it'll actually benefit them to use these methods. So, yeah. No, no, I got it. Yeah. He's in Belgium. Yeah. I created, I have like a Hillary package um, internally that has all the functions that I would use. It's true that sometimes I'll have like one function that's very, very specific to an analysis, but that's, that's packaged up within Project Template. So that'll be like shared, that'll be in the GitHub repo. Um, so like for that ops capacity planning thing, that was all the, like I created a few custom functions for various things, and so that was all shared. So yeah, I mean I try, I, I think it's either like, I think Hadley Wickham has a quote that's like, once you use a function twice, it should be in a package. Um, and so I totally agree with that. I mean, that's like another, another big thing, like creating that internal package was really helpful. And again, saves time because I don't have to explain what the functions do because there's like the man page, you know. So I can just complain to them using complainer if they ask me any questions. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that would really save a lot of time. Is a, is a thing, right? Mike Malecki, can you refer to that? Mike Malecki here? What's that? Isn't there like a Ripleyism package that gives you common things? He said. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This may have been discussed at the conference. Uh, we don't want to be that antagonistic, but <laughs> unlike the subject. <laughs> so, yeah, no, that would be a great one. Uh, BDR explainer? I don't know. Yeah. So. Cool. Thank you very much. Awesome. <laughs>